Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Emily Zarsk. How y'all doing, ladies? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. I'm, I'm on the road. I'm in uh, Fort Sam Houston. Uh, I'm in San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston today. So uh, thank you for the team here for hosting me and letting me uh, use their facility to do my chief chat. So, uh, but we got an awesome guest today. It's going to bring back some some nostalgia, especially from my childhood. Uh, but without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is an actor with more than 100 movie and TV credits, but he is best known as John Kreese, the villainous sensei from the Karate Kid movies and the Netflix series Cobra Kai. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Martin Cove. Hey. <laughs> Yay. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing good, sir. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really good. San Antonio what? is one of my favorite places. I was born on the day the Alamo fell. So oh, I have really? this affinity to San Antonio, to the Alamo. And uh, I love that town. Every time I go there, do a movie or something, I make sure the driver takes me. I don't care what time it is takes me by the Alamo and I, I just walk around and it could be midnight. And I just, I think the river walk and San Antonio is a great town, great town. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to some, some good Mexican food uh, later on today. So um, I love San Antonio. I was stationed here for, for about nine years of my career. And so, uh, you know, coming back to San Antonio is like coming back home. And, and I do remember this one uh, Pee Wee Herman movie. They were looking for the basement in the Alamo. It was, it was, it was, I just remember that as a child too. So, but uh, I, I want to thank you so much to the, for joining us on the show today. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I've been, you know, kind of hyping up this, the, the promo for this, uh, this show, because, you know, I, I loved Karate Kid uh, growing up. And, and so I always call you Mr. Mr. Sweep the Leg. So even, anytime I was introducing this, this, this show, I said, hey, we got Mr. Sweep the Leg coming to the show. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from today? I'm sorry? I said, can, can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from? Oh, I'm in Nashville. Yes, I'm in Nashville. I live in Nashville. And, uh, you know, just moved here from uh, L.A. And love it. Just love, you know, love the people and love the South. And it's really nice, you know, coming out of New York and LA and a whole different environment, a whole different cross section of mentalities. And it's terrific. It's easier here. It's just softer and more gentle. And, and there's a, I, I personally think there's a little more humanity. And, and the music scene is wonderful there too. I went to a make a wish foundation charity a night before last and it was thrown by jay demarcus who's the head of uh who was the lead singer for rascal flats and they had everybody there and he formed his own group so they had one of the um people from chicago one of the people from J from journey another from um two other bands and he of course playing the playing the um the organ there on from Rascal Flats and it was brilliant. It was just, you know, they did some old cover songs from each group, you know, and it was just sensational. And the music scene here is, I mean, I bought a jacuzzi and I had the electricians come and it was a whole team of four men with long blonde, blonde and silver hair. Turns out to be these reputable electricians of over 20 years in this neighborhood, they have their own rock group. They have, <laughs> these guys are 55, 60 years old, four of them, brothers, and they have their own rock group. And it's like 
everybody has a rock or a blues group in Nashville. You know, in LA, everybody's an actor. Here, everybody's in a rock group or a blues group, you know? Now that is pretty neat. Um, so we'd like to start off by talking about Cobra Kai. So Chief mentioned that the Karate Kid was a big part of his childhood, but also my childhood as well. And we're not a part of the same generation, but it just goes to show that your impact as an actor spans generations, right? So what has it been like returning to play John Kreese and what has that meant to you? Well, initially the character was sort of a one dimensional tough guy. And when we all met and discussed my participation in the show, um, Billy and Ralph, uh, were on and th they said to me, you know, are you interested? And I said, yeah, but I would like you to write the character a little more with, with texture and vulnerability and color rather than, you know, Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3, they were white hats and black hats. That was it. On the series, these writers are so, so very talented that they can play, you know, at writing the characters and more emotionally. And you can see it in, in the flashbacks where, uh, you know, he goes back in time and you see him in Vietnam and all, and you see why John Kreese is the way he is. In the movies, there was just two hours of play and you couldn't really get into some of this emotional background that you find in a series because you have a lot more time. You have 10 hours every season to explore the characters. And that's what I wanted them to do. I didn't want to play him one dimensional bad guy. And so in the series, it's a lot more versatile for me. And as the seasons go on, you'll see lots of changes with this character. So that's awesome. And we hear that the show's creators have been Karate Kids fans since they were young. How did their love of the original movie affect your decision to join the series? Well, you know, they were big fans. They were like Star Wars fans, you know. They <laughs> had seen the movie an infinite amount of times since 2006 when they first saw it. And, you know, they they were funny because I came in, you know, I have a podcast that I do with my children. It's called um, kicking it with the coves and my son, Rachel and my daughter, uh, my son, Jesse and my daughter, Rachel, they're the co-hosts with me and the writers <clears throat> were just on, um, uh, last this whole week. And they were, we did an hour with them with all three writers talking about the show and the history and why they got involved and how Cobra Kai became sold initially to YouTube. Because, you know, in the past, everybody's always come up to Ralph Macchio and myself or Billy and say, you know, we have a script just like Karate Kid. And, you know, it's a combination of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Karate Kid. And we want you guys to be in it. And it was always it was always, you know, uh, unsatisfactory as far as the material goes. And, you know, these characters were good salesmen, these three, the three writers and they were writing my character to be somewhat different, more versatile. And uh, even though I came in at the end of season one, I wanted to come in earlier and they said, no, you're coming in episode 10, season one to set up season two. And then of course I had to be, you know, quiet for months all the way till the airing of the show in May, which was very difficult, very, very difficult. I couldn't say that I was in the show because I was coming in episode 10 and I'm supposed to surprise everybody after 30 years, everybody thought I was dead. And um, it was hard, it was hard. And it came May and the show was very successful. And then I could finally talk about it. And they were right. It set up season two very well. And uh, from then on, you sort of trusted these writers you know, to answer your question, it was a long-winded answer, but you trusted these writers to do what they say they were going to do from a, a literal standpoint and what they were going to write. And that's what convinced me to sign on 
that I wasn't going to just get a lip service. They were such big fans. In fact, they were afraid at that lunch when they asked me to join the show. They were afraid because they had only seen that one dimension of John of Martin Cove that mm -hmm. I was going to get angry and kick their ass, <laughs> you know, because and they told me this on the on the podcast. They said we were afraid that you were going to get angry at us because we wanted you to come on episode 10 and you have to wait and you couldn't talk about the press to anybody for six months. We thought you weren't going to like that very much. So we were kind of reluctant. Were you going to, you know, do something to us at the table, you know? And of course I did because they were <laughs> intelligent, you know, but they were big fans, you know, and, and, you know, to me, it, it we're still good friends. We sit around, smoke cigars, and, and you know, they're, they're just 42-year-old kids, and they love movie stories and all that. It's not like, you know, I've done Cagney and Lacey, and I've done other projects where the other producers were had their own agenda. You know, they wanted other shows to go. They had other ideas. <clears throat> but these cats, they really just love Cobra Kai and love the Karate Kid and visit the writer Robert Kamen, who wrote the originals. And um, they're just, you know, they're, they're mentions as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, well, that's that's a sign of a great actor when you can be a villain or you can be mean on an actual like show and then it bleeds over in the real life to where people just think you're just as grumpy old man. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> that's a testament. That's a testament to your skill set. And, and the way you portray that character in the movie. So, um, but you also mentioned uh, that John Kreese was a Vietnam veteran and um, you played Vietnam veterans in other projects. So what, and you know, sometimes veterans are very critical about actors playing them in, in movies. And so what, have you heard any, any kind of feedback on your portrayals? And, and, and we all uh, here at the exchange, we're, we're well aware that the Vietnam veterans didn't get uh, treated the way they should have coming back from that war. And, and, and we, so we, we always, we're all in on trying to make sure that uh, we, we thank them and, and we, we always hold ceremonies every year uh, for Vietnam vets. But uh, just what's it like playing a Vietnam vet? Well, you know, I try to do as much backstory research as I can, you know. And um, <clears throat> for instance, when I did Rambo, First Blood Part Two, you know, and I did that right after Karate Kid One. I always try to do backstories. I always try to create backstories. A lot of things are not written, so you create material in between the lines of a script. And, you know, I, John Milius, who wrote Apocalypse Now and Red Dawn and Rough Riders, <clears throat> lots of wonderful scripts, Dirty Harry, he's a friend of mine. And he would introduce me to a lot of mercenaries, a lot of soldiers of fortune, you know, a lot of um, Vietnam vets, and I would go interview them. And the fun thing about playing in a character that is really, if you can interview the character, you know, it's great, but most of the time they're gone. But you interview friends and family, and the, what you pick up as an actor from, what they tell you about his personal habits you know it's like you know like you're watching a western with steve mcqueen and you know you you, you kind of know that steve mcqueen loved props steve mcqueen had a favorite thing about props you know um sir Lawrence olivier had a thing about noses he always put a different nose and you know and brando did things with his voice you know so Everybody's got a special little thing, whether you're an actor or not, that you like to incorporate in your role. So many times I would, you know, when I did my research and I found out that, well, the, you know, the, 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 you, you, my son, when he was alive, always twirled paper in his finger, you know, just made these little balls with paper and wet paper and wet it and roll it around. And I would use that. And I thought it was interesting amidst all the pressure on Vietnam in the jungle, on a soldier, what he had to contend with, which is astronomical. You know, I have such a greatest amount of respect for every time I see a film or a documentary, 
to think that we complain. We complain about our personal problems. Just imagine two hours of sleep every night crawling in the jungle, whether it's World War II on Bataan or it's Okinawa, or basically you're in the jungles off Saigon. I mean, we have nothing to complain about in our lives compared to what they had to go through year after year, depending on how many tours they booked. But the amount of respect I have is um, enormous. And that's why I love doing the research on Vietnam characters. Um, there were so many. We, I watched Apocalypse Now last week. Apocalypse Now redo, R-E-D-U-X. It's an extended director's cut version. And it was fantastic because it gave you a lot more inf interesting information and spent more time with Marlon Brando as Colonel Kurtz and with Martin Sheen as the assassin going up the river to, to kill Kurtz. And you got a sense of the characters because it was the director's cut. And to me, research and development is often more important and certainly more exciting than the event of shooting a movie. You know, I went to, uh, to um, Camp Pendleton last month and I signed 789 autographs in two hours. And mm. you had a fellow with a clicker just counting all the Marines that were lining up. And then I went to their motor pool. And then I, I, I went to the memorial on, on the base. I had the greatest time. I was exhausted, but I had the greatest time. And they had a good time. And you get a sense of, you know, and everybody should do this. Like everybody should ride with a policeman and see how they put their lives on the line. You know, everybody should have a ride along just to respect what a policeman does. You know, how, he, how especially detectives put themselves on the line, even officers who ride the highways. You never know who's going to, what they're going to do and pull out of a glove compartment, you know, and, and, and you're pulling them over for a broken headlight. And all of a sudden you're in big trouble if the guy pulls a gun. People pull, you know, policemen and, 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 and soldiers and armed forces all, you know, they, they should be co-experienced by the public. If you don't have a sense of the devotion and loyalty of these people to protect the country and to protect the cities, you should ride along with them. You should just get in the car and ride with them. And if you can't go visit the army bases, Navy bases and, you know, Marines and get a sense of them because it is really it's astronomically important and emotionally it, it's beyond anything you can imagine. And everybody just looks at a movie. It's not about a movie. It's about putting your life on the line and you can't do that in a movie. Oh, movies, sunglasses and autographs. It's nonsense. Go out and experience it for real. Anyway, that's my answer about Vietnam and, and all the characters, because I, I take it very seriously when I play those people. You know, um, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Yep. Now, we appreciate the love and support very much. Now, speaking of crime and kind of, you know, getting in the front seat with police officers, you actually appeared in some TV crime shows like Starsky and Hutch, The Rockford Files, Charlie's Angels, and a few more. So do you have any stories that you could share with us about that period? Well, you know, what was interesting about, I did Cagney and Lacey for six years. And, you know, the Tyne Daly and, and Sharon Gless, who played Cagney and Lacey, they didn't do action very well. So we would sit around and read the script a week before the upcoming episode. And then I was very excited because I was the macho character who didn't think women should be detectives. And this is circa 1982 to 1988. And, you know, um, the show was ahead of its time because now you can do that and it would be appreciated. Then, you know, no one wanted to see two women as detectives. And I played a character who was a macho character who didn't want to see two women playing detectives. So I was always so excited as the actor when they write me action, because I always wanted the show to be called Cagney, Lacey and his Becky. That was my character's name. 
But that was his vision of this machismo guy. And when I did my homework and interviewed a lot of detectives in San Bernardino, on their locker, they would have in their locker, this specific guy had a Winchester. He had a lever action Winchester and he was in love with the West. And I'm in love with the old West. I'd like the Western to return. So he had John Wayne pictures all over his desk and under his glass on his, on the desk itself. And he would always, you know, poke fun at the girls because they would be wearing these, these vests and he punched them right in the chest all the time. And they wear the vests, but he did it. You know, you couldn't do it today because you'd get, you'd, you'd go up to HR and get thrown in, you know, that problems. But in those, in those days, he would just kid around with the women and they were just terrific ladies. I mean, they were strong as the characters and they would, you know, but it was more accepted. Now it's more accepted than it was then. But one of the funny stories was that they'd always write out the action in the script. We'd read it, sit down in the read through. A week later, the action scenes were gone, not because I could do them well, but because they'd rather go right to having the perp sitting in the car being arrested already instead of focusing on the action. And it always amazed me that the greatest story I can remember about Cagney and Lacey was I had done White Buffalo with Charles Bronson. And that was 1976. And it was my first Western, second Western in Hollywood. I did Gunsmoke first. And then we had a great time. 15 years later, after Karate Kids, about 1989, I'm in a black tie affair and I see Charlie Bronson. And I say, Charlie, you remember me from White Buffalo? And he says, yeah. He says, you're still doing that series with them girls? I take a step back and I say, yeah, you mean Cagney and Lacey? He says, yeah, it's my favorite show. Charles Bronson's favorite show was a story about two women with no action who were cops in a period of time when no one wanted a female cop. And I'm amazed. I said, it's your favorite show? He says, yeah, I love that show. It's a great show. You're good in it. I don't do anything but, you know, be a wise guy, you know? I don't get any action. I don't get any. So I used to have to, I always would tell that story. But I would go off and, and do movies all the time um, from that show because that show was a diet of art. It wasn't like Cobra Kai where you mix up action and art. It was really mostly about issues that appeared in the New York Times and mostly feminist issues, you know, because the show was about two women. But um, there were all kinds of stories, you know, I could, the, the, the funny story wasn't the cop story, but it was, it was a story about um, Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner. And um, as a kid, I would always fist fight and go <laughs> and make that sound, you know, as you're hitting someone. Some people hit their chest. Everybody does that as a kid when you're fake fisting. So I did a scene where I'm, I punch him out in wider and I'm not aware that when I go, <laughs> I would cross in front of my mouth and make that sound. Well, the sound guy says, Where's the sound coming from? Where's the sound coming from? No one can figure it out. We do the scene once, twice, three, four times. And you can't see me. You can't see my mouth because I'm going across. And the scene's great. But where's the sound coming from? The sound guy's going nuts. And then I realized it was me. I was making that sound when I would punch like that. And it was just instinctive as if when I was a kid, I never thought about it. And so like Larry, Larry Kasdan, the director, everybody's there and Kevin in the tent trying to figure out where the sound's coming from. And then I, I said, well, I better confess. I said, it's me, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just, it's unconscious. I'm doing this. And I thought they were, you know, I said, I, well, I might get fired. And they all cracked up hysterical because every one of these characters, the sound man, the director, Larry Kasdan, Kevin, they all did the same thing. Some of the guys would hit their chest when they fake fisted as a kid. Some would make those sounds. 
So it was just, it was just classic. And I felt at home throughout the whole movie after that, because you know, Kevin Costner likes to make a Western from any movie he's doing, he tries to turn it into a Western. And it's my favorite genre. And I, you know, I'm doing as much as I can to get the Western back. But um, it, 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 there's a lot of other stories that I could tell you, but it would take up the whole hour, you know. <laughs> I love that story, though. You're your own sound guy. That's great. Yeah. It happened, <laughs> but, um... it happened before. In 1980, I did it again on a screen test and for Paris, for a Western character, a comic strip character. And it turned out to be a year later, I bumped into the director and he showed me the screen test. And he says, but there was this sound of a punch that we never could figure out. And he was French and he edited, edited everything in Paris. And he, he <laughs> says, there was a sound that we never could figure out where it came from when you hit the guy. And I just never told the truth. I just said, oh God, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, and I knew it was me who did it. And it was a year that's later. That's pretty good. And you yeah. also had a couple of TV series before The Karate Kid, but the movie was the, the movie is what turned out to be a big hit. We understand that there's quite a story behind your audition, and I'm hoping you can talk about that. <laughs> well, they gave me the script. The casting woman, Carol Jones, gave me the script on a Monday. And she says, you have the whole week. They'll bring you in on Friday. So it was the scene that you're at the beginning of the movie, you know, I'm walking in the, in the aisles screaming, mercy is for the weak here and on the streets. Somebody confronts you, they are the enemy. And I'm walking in the aisles of a dojo, barking this at my students. So that's the scene. <clears throat> All of a sudden I get a call Tuesday morning. I hadn't looked at this. Nine o'clock in the morning, I get a call. You gotta be on the, on the set at 12 o'clock John Abelson, the director. Now, John had directed Rocky and another movie called Joe. Wonderful director. He says he wants to see you at noon. I'm livid. So I said to my wife, I said to Vivian, God, this is terrible. And she says, use all that venom, all that negative energy that you feel right now, that anger, use it on them. And when you get there and then go right into the scene which the scene was high energy. So I got to the appointment and I get to see the director and I say, you're an ass, John Abelson. And so are you, Carol Jones. We wait to meet directors of your caliber for years. And then you don't give us enough time with the script. You're a real ass, John Abelson. Mercy is for the weak, here and on the streets. You know, and I went right into it, like right into it. And he loved it. Sends me to Jerry Weintraub, big macha in the business. Produced Diner, produced Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3, Ocean's 11, 12, and 13. Big deal. He's four days late for the interview. So I do the same thing. I figure, well, I'm doing Cagney and Lacey. This is during hiatus. I shouldn't have a problem. And if I don't get the part, I don't get the part. It's just like another heavy. Jerry Weintraub comes in. I say, you know, Jerry, I've been waiting for four days for you. You're late for this appointment and I'm on pins and needles. You're a real ass. And so are you, Carol Jones. Mercy is for the week. <laughs> Boom. He loved it. Stopped me halfway through the audition, sent me to the head of the studio. I didn't do it to the head of the studio because he wasn't there. It was just Pat Morita's working with me on the set and, and someone holding a camera. So I screamed and yelled in the bathroom, again came out, got all that energy going, and did the scene and the rest is history. You're part of the gift that keeps giving, you know? I love that. That's one, that's one way to insult someone without them knowing they're being insulted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I had no you can't do You can't do that <clears throat> to some directors that don't have the confidence to take it. You know, you go, you go to some frail little guy and you, know, you tell him you're an ass, man. You know, you should have been here earlier. They'll kick you out of the room. They'll just say, you know, goodbye. I've been thrown out of a room by, you know, 
by being a bit aggressive. I don't do it anymore, but you know, it all depends on how confident the human being is on the other end, of, on the other end of the table. Right. Yeah, man, I, I didn't, I didn't realize the power of calling people asses. So that's a, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, so, so you mentioned your, uh, earth. Get your job like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mentioned earlier that you you've got your own podcast and it's called uh kicking it with the coves with your twins jesse and rachel so uh how is it doing a podcast with your kids you know can you give tell us what that experience is like well so far we've had <clears throat> the the greatest pod uh, podcast we did was when i was in la and did it live not zoom and we had the three writers on and it was brilliant because they would tell stories that I'd never heard before and it was great. And then yesterday we did one with Chris Jericho and he's, you know, musician as well as a wrestler. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've had, so, you know, we've had psychologists. We, my daughter's a life coach, so she's dealing with alcoholism and drug addiction and all that every day. And, you know, my son is an actor who guest starred on, uh, in season three as a bully bullying my, me back in 1965. It's a flashback sequence in a diner. And people think that he's me, but ultimately he's bullying me. And I was the bus boy back in 1965 when John Kreese, when uh, he was working. But, you know, we talk about that. <clears throat> Jesse is, a, you know, an actor. He's very good as as a commentator. And my daughter is so knowledgeable. And it's really a pleasure because I was the calling card to this. And, you know, they wanted to do it with me. And I said, let's do it with the kids. And Rachel liked that idea. And, you know, Rachel once takes acting classes and she sings and all. And she really loves show business. So here's a little hook for her to be in her own game. So I'm doing it for the kids primarily, you know, but it's fascinating all of the different things you learn as a radio commentator, because you can watch it on YouTube or on Spotify or Apple, but I'm a visual person. So I like to watch the show on YouTube, but it's really fascinating or from what you learn from all these guests. It's really terrific. And the confidence I have in my kids, they just, they shine out there. You know, they're 31, they're twins, and they just shine, you know? And I, it, it's worth all, I, I don't make any money. It's worth all the effort, you know, to go and schlep all the way to the studio and do it on, on Zoom. And, you know, yesterday I got to get up at eight o'clock in the morning after doing this Make-A-Wish Foundation deal. And um, it's so much fun, whether you do it on Zoom, it gives you as a father inner satisfaction to see your kids being pros, complete pros. And they don't have any experience doing this. They just instinctively do it right. And, you know, making the questions up and doing the research on the guests. It's, um, we've had the actors from the show, we've had you know, Peyton List, we've had Jacob Bertram, who plays Hawk. You know, we've had yesterday one of the original Karate Kid Cobra Kai members, Ron Thomas, who played Bobby. And we've had, you know, doctors and and uh, coaches from Pepperdine University out in California who have coached the soccer team at Pepperdine for 29 years. And the great thing is when you, you bring a coach on, John Kreese always asks, what style of coaching do you teach? You know, do you teach the way my maniac character teaches or do you have more patience and are you kinder to the athletes? And so this, yeah, you know, there's so many aspects of it that are positive and exciting. Yeah, so Cobra Kai also has a lot of celebrity fans, such as Carrie Underwood, who did a cameo on the show, and then also Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who not only said Bruce Lee would have loved it, but said that it's even better than the Karate Kid movies. So who are some other celebrity fans that you've heard from about Cobra Kai? 
Well, you hear, you hear from, um, uh, I think it was, uh, you'd be surprised how many people really watch the show that will throw something on Instagram. And um, Carrie Underwood was great. She, she really was fun, you know. And uh, I remember walking up to her and uh, we were chatting on the day she did the show. And I said, hi, I'm Marty Cove. And she goes, and she's so gorgeous. And she says, I know. And I said, well, I just moved to Nashville. And then she goes, I know. And I just <laughs> froze. I just froze. And he goes, I know. You know, I mean, I just, oh my God. You know, she's so delicious. And, um, you know, the other, I'm trying to think of, there's a lot of Instagram characters that people just leave messages on Instagram. The the old Laker um, um, Worthy, Kareem's first name. A worthy? Yeah. James Worthy? Yeah. Yeah, James Worthy. He left a lovely Instagram message, and Eli Roth, the director, did. And um, I remember... I remember when I got Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is another little story for you. And, you know, I knew that Tarantino was a, you know, I bugged him to be in Grateful Eight. I'd really, I wanted to be in any one of Westerns that he does. And I wasn't in Hateful Eight and I wasn't in Django. And I remember I got an offer to be Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, um, and I went to the pre-party with, with uh, uh quentin was there and i walked up to him and i knew he was a cobra kai fan he had he had also put something in on i think it was um uh, i think it was instagram as well how he enjoyed the show so i walked up to him and i said quentin i said did you ask me you know for years i've been bugging you to be in one of your westerns i said did you invite me here to make this offer because I'm hot from Cobra Kai or because I drove you nuts for two years. And he looked at me with a big smile and he says, a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So a little bit of your commercial success and a little bit of your tenacity, you know, <laughs> but he was, and <clears throat> he was a great guy. You know, he, he would do, I mean, he just made everybody comfortable. He would, he, he would turn to the cast, to the crew, and he'd say, I think we got it, but we're going to shoot one more, meaning one more take. And he turns to them, and he, as he says it, he says, and do you know why? And all the crew, 100, 200 people, all scream out in unison, because we love to make movies. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody, I mean, then you know everybody's there because they really just want to be there because he makes filmmaking so much fun, you know, and he does. He's just really a cool guy. And, uh, you know, but um, I have to go to Calgary so I can't hang too much longer. I, I have to, I'm doing an autograph show. So it's, they're picking me up shortly. But, um, Throw me another question. I have another two minutes. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to jump on and say, you know, we are so thankful that you're spending time with us today. We know you're really busy and we're getting so much love in the chat um, from all of our um, military all over the world. And I did just want to ask um, one question um, for you, and it's from Tim. Tim is asking, what has been your most challenging and rewarding role? I tell you, it's, <clears throat> I did a movie called Price for Freedom, and it was about a book. And I played, I played the second in command to the Ayatollah Khomeini. It was a character, a real life character, called uh, Ayatollah Konkali was his name. He was the right hand man to Khomeini. And how does an American? who has nothing in common with the terrorists, nothing in common with the Iranians, nothing in common with that political administration. How do you play this guy? So <clears throat> I had to wear a turban, I had a beard. It was, 
I put round glasses on. And this is about five years ago. And I came upon the theory that the only way to play him successfully, you can't just telephone the performance in. I could never do that no matter what the role is. You do your best no matter what. Um, to, so I found the key was that this fellow, because you know what he did was he ran the court. So anybody, if you wore a red shirt, red pants, blue shirt, anybody who wore even colors on their, on their body, he interpreted it as you were sympathetic to the West and you needed to die with your family. We need to confiscate your belongings. He would just run the court that way, totally illegitimate. And he, he was, he was a, you know, a zealot. How do you portray a zealot? And I said to myself, the only way to portray a zealot would be that he thinks he's a hero to his people, that he thinks he is doing the right thing and that he is saving his people from the Americans, saving his people from Western influence. And he is a hero to his people. And I got through it by thinking that because there were no similarities or parallels in Martin Cove and this guy, Ayatollah Kunkali. You know, th these are the people I go out in the streets with my Winchester and look for, you know? I mean, and um, so that was probably the hardest because I had nothing in common with the character, nothing. So I had to create a simpatico, a parallel that was honest and real. And it turned out to be I got an award because uh, from that, you know, that doing that picture, it was in a film festival and all. Unfortunately, the movie didn't go anyplace, but it, the book was very much like a Schindler's List about a dentist who, Park Avenue dentist in Manhattan, who would go to Iran and free a lot of his friends and pay money to get them freed. Very much like Schindler and Schindler's List during World War II, you know. F fascinating story. Fascinating story. But um, absolutely, there was, then there was the cats on the other side who were just... <clears throat> You wore a red shirt. You were a Western th sympathizer. I mean, so insane. Yeah. Uh, so, Marty, man, we appreciate you uh, for spending some time with us. We know you got to, you know, head to head to Calgary. But uh, we, we really appreciate the time that you spent uh, with us today. You 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 we could literally talk to you all day, man. You got some awesome stories, uh, a very compelling uh, life. And and I'm, I'm going to take some nuggets. I'm probably not going to take the ass thing. Uh, <laughs> with me but but there's some other compelling parts of of, of, the, of the story that i was like oh my goodness this is awesome so um i just want to say personally say thank you and, and um and since we're probably not going to be able to do the formal goodbyes after the show because you got to go uh, i just want to let you know that i want to give you uh my own personal uh military challenge coin um and so i'll get with your team and and, and get a good address to send it to but uh that's just a token of my appreciation for being on the show today i appreciate that well, then I'll come. I'll come back. You know, it was just one of those things that fit in today because I had to go. But I'll come back again, and we'll do, we'll do, we'll do some more stories. You know, I got plenty of stories. Yes, I got. Yes. Yes. I got so, yes. many, so many other bizarre stories that you know. It, it, yeah, there, there's a lot of you know good stuff, and I had to sit down and write a little memoir thing, but I don't have the discipline. I've been trying to write a western for 20 years. And I want to bring back the Western. I want to, but the only way a Western will come back to all these kids who don't know anything about a Western is to have incredible characters like what Robert Kamen did. To me, you know, I used to have this argument with the Karate Kid writer. He would always say that what made the movie successful was the chemistry between Ralph Macchio and Pat Morita. And I would say absolutely not. What made that movie so successful and the fact that we're talking about it today, 35 years later, is because you wrote the dialogue like sweep the leg, no mercy, wax on, wax off, and was saying this dialogue 35 years later. And you only mm -hmm. do that from movies like 
classic movies like Star Wars, Force Be With You. You bring up lines like from the old movie, you know, Gone with the Wind. Frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a damn, you know. Play it again, mm-hmm. Sam. From <laughs> There's only a few words you remember. In, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you say, hey, I'm making this up as I go along, you know. And you remember a lot of Harrison Ford lines and stuff. Those usually constitute, they come from really good movies because you remember the movies well. When you remember the lines from a picture, you usually have the, the whole movie in the back of your head. And I think yeah. it's the writer that contributes and makes the success of the, it isn't the characterizations, it isn't us. You know, we make good characters, but if the writer doesn't put it on the paper, that's the successful element of Karate Kid that, you know, they were able to put it together and the chemistry was great and the vision was great from the director and all that. But if the words weren't on the paper, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Well, well, hopefully, hopefully you get out, get in there and, and get us a Western coming in the next few years because you you you've uh, I can tell that you're super passionate about it, and like you said, we need to bring that back so uh, so our, our kids can can kind of see where that came from. So uh, uh, we, yeah. we definitely got your support here at the exchange, and, and again, I appreciate your time, uh, and I and just thank you, thank you so much for what you've been doing uh, for your my whole pleasure, life. appreciate. It. My yeah. pleasure, all of you. Take care of yourselves. And I thank and, you know, tell everybody out there, I I respect and thank them all for their services. And, you know, um, it's it's a privilege just to be here today. Absolutely, absolutely. So with that being said, uh, thank you again, uh, Marty, and uh, Chief Chat out. All right.